Welcome to King County Connects, a program where we connect you with the important issues in our region. I'm Enrique Cerna. Does Washington need the death penalty? The state legislature is considering a bill that would abolish our state's 38-year-old death penalty law. Some prosecutors argue the process is too slow, too costly, and unworkable. And we're talking today with King County Prosecuting Attorney Dan Satterberg about his, his insights on this issue. Well, you have come out, uh, editorial that came out in the Seattle Times, and then you testified down in Olympia. Uh, you say we do not need the death penalty any longer. Well, Enrique, I've been on the front lines of this struggle to administer the death penalty for the last 27 years, first as Norm Mailing's chief of staff for 17 years, and then over the last decade as the elected prosecutor. I've d met with scores of families and tried to figure out the legal and financial aspects of seeking the death penalty. I've witnessed the state's last execution in 2010 to support the family of the victim. Uh, I may be late to the party, but I've come to the conclusion that we don't need it, and in fact, our criminal justice system would be stronger without it. When you say you've come late to the party, did you at one time say, yes, we need the death penalty? I have sought the death penalty as a prosecutor. I've participated in the, as a witness to executions, and we've tried to make it work. And as you say, we've had it now for 38 years, and so I think it's appropriate for the legislature to step back and, and give it the same kind of scrutiny that they would any other program. Uh, but let me say first, it's not necessary for public safety because we have what we call life without parole. We call it LWOP, L-W-O-P. A life without parole sentence is the sentence that somebody gets for an aggravated murder if they don't get the death penalty. And what that means is you go to prison and you stay there till you die. We don't get out, never see the light of day, never free breath. And so the whole fight about capital punishment is whether or not we can hasten the date of that person's death. They're gonna die in prison either way. We're fighting, we're spending millions of dollars and decades of time and resources to see if we can't advance the date of their death and authorize a state employee to give a lethal dose of drugs to an inmate. And I just don't think it's worth that fight. So we don't need it for public safety. It's clearly not a deterrent to crime. I mean, people who commit violent crimes, they don't think about the legal consequences. And if, if, if they stop to think about the minuscule chance they would have of being executed by the state of Washington, they wouldn't, they wouldn't give it a second thought. But I think we should give it a second thought. Is this a moral issue? It is for a lot of people, and, and I leave that to them. And I respect, I respect the opinions on all sides. I mean, the death penalty is an emotional issue. Yeah some of the horrific facts, people victimized, torn apart. It's a political issue. It's a moral and religious issue for some people. Me, I've just been trying to make it work. And I've come to the conclusion that our law is broken and it can't be fixed. When you say trying to make it work, explain that more. So for 38 years, we've had this law. It came on by Citizens Initiative in 1980. In 38 years, we have executed, against their will, two people. Charles Campbell, Cal Brown. Now, three men who were convicted of aggravated murder, got the death sentence, instructed their attorneys to not appeal. They decided, I'd rather die now than to, for the next 20 years, wake up every day in prison knowing that I'm going to die in prison. And the state obliged them, which I always thought right. was a little curious. That we were yeah, assist Wesley Allen Dodd, I interviewed him, mm -hmm. and uh, he wanted to, to die, he said. It was state-assisted suicide, but putting those, two case, those three cases away, we've executed two people against their will in 38 years, and we've spent upwards of $50 million trying to give effect to it. Now what happens, so we don't need it for public safety because these people aren't getting out. It's not a deterrent, it's a punishment, and that's why we call it capital punishment. Uh, the question is, is the punishment worth it? And people will focus on the horrific nature of these crimes and what these men deserve. And yeah, they, you could certainly make the case that the men who committed these crimes, they don't deserve to live. I'm asking the legislature to ask instead, what do we deserve? What do we in the, in the state of Washington, the citizens here, and people in the criminal justice system trying to give effect to this? Can't we just say after 38 years, this doesn't work, and we deserve a better system that doesn't, isn't so unfairly applied? And that's the other part of this, unworkable. You know, the last... Uh, death penalty cases that we had here in King County. They were the two Carnation defendants and the Montfort case, uh, Christopher Montfort, who executed Seattle Police Officer Timothy Brenton. We spent a combined $15 million on defense attorney costs for those cases, just for the defense, $15 million. At a time that we were also cutting 
resources from the criminal justice system because our budget is always under under fire. We're always short of money. So it, it comes into town and it takes away resources that we need for, for just basic infrastructure for other kinds of cases, domestic violence cases and sexual assault cases, car theft, you name it. Anything that, but when the, when the death penalty comes to town, it, ta it siphons off resources that are needed elsewhere, which is why only two or three of Washington's 39 counties could even think about doing it. Yeah, but King County is the largest county in the state, obviously. You've got the largest prosecuting attorney's office in the state as well. I, I would imagine that uh, small counties or those in, in central and eastern Washington that don't have the financial resources. Yeah, and, the, and the leaders there might say, we support the death penalty, but they would never even think about doing it. It would bankrupt their county. Uh, in short order. So any penalty that's applied so unfairly uh, seems to me also to be worth looking at again. King, former King County Sheriff, now Congressman uh, uh, Dave Reichert, uh, you know, said that it was the, that threat of the death penalty that made the difference in the Gary Ridgeway Green River killer case and uh, got him to, you know, finally say that yes, he'd killed 48 women, uh, although they suspected more than that. You were part of that case as was. well. During that time, I mean, uh, did, were you in favor of the idea of, of going for the death penalty with the guy? Well, you know, if anybody deserved to die, this man deserved to die. Uh, but once we started that process here in King County, immediately he was assigned eight attorneys full-time, no other case. So he had eight attorneys and about six other staff, so a small law firm on his side, which was starting to consume resources on our side. Now we had seven cases charged, and we, we would never have had any more because that's all the forensic evidence that we could get with Ridgeway. So we, but Norm Mailing had decided early on, yes, this is a death penalty case, and then a year or two into it is when his attorneys approached us with this idea. If you set aside the death penalty, he will tell you about all the other crimes that he can remember. Um, that was a really hard decision for Norm. He, th he thought about that for about three weeks because his initial reaction was, no, he doesn't deserve that. Right. And then we started thinking about, well, what do the victim's families deserve? So stop thinking about what he deserves. What, are, what do they want? And, and we knew and through the police and the sheriff's office really wanted us to do this as well. They wanted to close these cases. They wanted answers. You know, that, there, are, there are some good reasons to think about keeping the death penalty. It's why it's been so difficult to have this conversation. Uh, one of them that people always say, well, you need it for leverage. You need the death penalty as a prosecutor for leverage. Well, uh, that's also a bad reason to have it because we know in other parts of, of the country, and it hasn't happened to my knowledge in Washington State, but, but a lot of times when you hear about these cases where people were wrong, wrongfully convicted, it was because they were forced to plead guilty to something because the prosecutor was threatening to kill them. Right. You, I'll take the death penalty off the table if you plead guilty. Well, I didn't do it. Well, it's still, it's still the deal, you gotta decide. Uh, I think that's unfair leverage, and we've never used it in that way, although we did use it to get the, the, the truth in the Ridgeway case. So it, it, it is, uh, that was a one, that was a unique case. I hope we'll never see another one like that again. It's certainly not a reason that I would keep this law because it worked for us you know, 20 years ago in, in the Ridgeway case. Personally, have you been torn about this? I've been frustrated by it. Because here's the other thing that happens when you're, when you're applying the death penalty and, and if you, you get, if, if the jury convicts, and that's been a difficult, I mean, the, the conviction's not the hard part. If the jury then uh, gives, grants the death penalty, um, now you're on a 20-year journey of appeals. It goes directly to the state Supreme Court and then it goes to the federal courts and it comes back to the state Supreme Court for a second round. We call personal restraint petitions and then back to the federal court for habeas petitions. We have cases that have been on appeal for 20 years. And every time they get looked at, uh, you know, the, the courts are looking for perfection. So any error that might have happened in the, in the trial is, is now takes on this huge proportion because the stakes are so high, much more likely that a case is going to get reversed. And so we've actually had about 75% of the death verdicts that we've been given over the years have been reversed on appeal by courts of appeals, not because the person wasn't guilty, but maybe, there, maybe it was ineffective assistance of counsel. They would have liked to see their lawyer work a little bit harder or make different arguments or whatever the, the case may be. So the cases are vulnerable to being reversed because they stay up there in the courts of appeals for decades. Now, if it was just a simple life without possibility of parole, 
that appeal would be over in about three years, and there'd be finality for the victims. And that's my third point, is that the death penalty doesn't really serve the interests of victims. Victim families that go through this horrific you know, crime against a loved one, I have always sought input, tell me what you think about the death penalty. And at that moment when they're in this terrible loss and grief, the thought of giving any sort of break to the defendant, for a lot of people, like, they can't do it. Of course, it's, they, they, they see it as somehow a, a, a valuation of, of the value of the life of the loved one. Of justice. course I want the maximum want justice. Yeah. But then you say, well, then this is what might happen. You know, it, it might be 20 years before this, this comes through. Now, I, I told you, I, I sat and watched the, uh, I was a witness to the execution of Cal Brown in Walla Walla, 2010. That case, tell me more over that case. Yeah, okay. so a 21-year-old woman from Nebraska, Holly Washaw, came out to SeaTac to get a, a job and was employed at a hotel. Cal Brown uh, kidnapped her, he raped her, tortured her, killed her, and then he got on a plane and he flew down to California and, and kidnapped another woman. And, was, and fortunately, she didn't die, but she almost did. So he was a horrific predator, terrible guy. A jury convicted him uh, and, and sentenced him to die. Fast forward 20 years, and we're in Walla Walla. It took 20 years for that. We went up to the U.S. Supreme Court on it, went through all the federal courts, and I was with the family of Holly Washaw, father and sister, two sisters and a brother, and we watched him give his last words, and it really infuriated the family. He said, well, I forgive Holly Washaw's family if they hate me. And they thought, yeah, we we don't want your forgiveness. And you know, it was they were very it was very emotional, and, and it was not it was upsetting to them. But finally, when we watched the lethal injection administered, and he about thirty seconds later was pronounced dead, the I will never forget. Uh, Holly's sister said to me, "Well, now we don't have to think about him anymore." You see, they were convinced that somewhere in that twenty-year journey through the court system, that some judge somewhere was going to let him out, yeah. or at least make him go back and do another trial. And I thought, at that moment, I thought, man, if we had gotten the life sentence right away, they would have been able to say, now we don't have to think about him like three years after the verdict instead of 20 years later. And didn't they, in, in that whole situation, at one point come to Walla Walla where they thought he was going to be executed, only to learn when they were like in the parking lot? I met him in the parking lot, five o'clock of that night. Them? Yes, I got a call that the state Supreme Court had stayed the execution. Oh my God. They'd driven from Nebraska in these two beat up little cars, I don't know how they even made it. I, I took them out to dinner, they got in their cars, they drove back. A year later we flew them out in their plane. I didn't know that they had those, that kind of transportation issue. But yeah, they'd been there once, and there, for them it was just another part of this roller coaster, which is why I conclude after all these years, it really doesn't serve the interest of victim families to put them through this, when what they want most of all is just to know that this guy's never going to get out, he's never going to hurt anybody, and he's going to die in prison. And here's the other thing, the, the, the men who are on death row right now, one of them's been there for 25 years, another for 20, another for 18. We had a death row inmate last year die of natural causes. Mm -hmm. It's more likely that the men on death row are going to die of natural causes than they're going to die from an execution, partly because we have such a long process of appeals, and the public pays for those appeals. It's very expensive, and it goes on for decades. And then if we ever were to get to the final stage of that, our governor has said, there's a moratorium. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to allow any state employees to actually carry it out. And who knows what the next governor might say. And we have a moratorium in Oregon. You know, so it, it, it's a lot of effort to try to hasten the date of death of somebody. We're spending tens of millions of dollars on that. It doesn't help public safety. It's not applied fairly throughout the state. Only a couple of counties can do it. And, and I think it really takes the victims on a decades-long journey that, that ultimately does not satisfy their need for finality. As you were writing this uh, op-ed and then also going to go down to the legislature to testify um, before the, the Senate Legislative Committee that's taking up this bill. Um, did you talk to any of the other families of, uh, that also are victims in a situation like this of the men that are on? I did. I did. I, I met with King County of the eight men on death row. Those eight men, after 38 years, you've got eight people waiting execution, and two of the cases are from King County. And I did meet with the father of the, um, the family that was um, 
killed in the Connor Shireman case, Leo Milken. And he's a wonderful guy, and he's a, a military uh, man and, and was serving his country when this terrible crime happened to yeah, him. Yeah, this is a family that was, was yes. completely wiped out. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And awful case. Terrific. Um, and I told him what I was going to do, and he was not very happy with me, I'll tell you. But Because he thinks he... he th and God bless him, I, I have tremendous respect for him. He, he thinks he won something. He thinks he won a death verdict. And I, I hate to be the one to tell him the truth that this may never be carried out. And we're, if it is, it's 20 years from now because the Shireman case was argued in a state Supreme Court. The first appeal was argued two and a half years ago and the case still sits there and the court hasn't ruled on it. And that's just what happens to these cases. They sit and they languish. And they're vulnerable to reversal that whole time, and and that m makes me very well, concerned the, too. The technicalities, of, but even in the uh, the case involving the Carnation family, um, that took so long just to get into court, didn't it? It took eight years to start that trial. We went to the state supreme court three times to get to be able to offer the jury the option of death, and when we finally got there, the jury's also told about the life without release option. And they have to be unanimous to, uh, to, to, for a death verdict. And so, so several of the jurors, after deliberating a day, day and a half or so, decided no, they didn't want the death penalty because the guy was never going to get out. So that was that. We worked really hard to offer the jury something which ultimately they didn't want. And they saw that the, the life without possibility of release sentence um, protected the public just as much as, as the other one. In fact, what they didn't know is I think the LWAP protects the community in a greater fashion because it's over. The appeals are over in three years, done, you're going to die in prison versus this decades-long journey through the court system that capital litigation is. How, how is the death penalty, I guess, looked at uh, across the country? What other states are grappling with the same thing? Uh, I know there are obviously some states where the death penalty is, such as in Texas, where they, you know, they, they, they use it. And, uh, but where else, in, but, but what's the status sure. elsewhere in the country? So there are 19 states that don't have the death penalty, which is a, a pretty big number. And, big and, number. and yeah, if you look at them, actually. and the other surprising thing is, and it goes to this deterrence argument, if you look at the murder rate in the states that don't have it, it's lower than in the states that do. It's not related to crime or public safety in, in, in any way. And you look at the West Coast, so we have eight people on death row, and we have a governor's moratorium. Uh, in Oregon, there are 33 men on death row, and they've had a moratorium on executions for 10 years. If you go down to California, where everything that could go wrong in a criminal justice system has, there are 750 men on death row, Whoa. and they haven't had an execution in 13 years, and they're not likely to. And so they've tried by initiative twice in the last five years to abolish it, and it's failed both times. So it just, to me, shows, it shows that people are, there's an emotional reaction to this, uh, and people really haven't looked at hard at the, at the cost-benefit analysis of this government program. Every other government program has to go undergo all this scrutiny, but capital punishment, if you held it up, took away the emotion and the politics and held it up and said, does this work? You'd, by any measure, you'd have to conclude this has been a failed government program, and we have a perfectly good option of life without release. I would imagine that you've had people say to you that, hey, you're just looking at costs here. You're looking at the financial end of things and the impact, and you're not looking at the, what this does to a family. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I, we do dwell on the cost because they are so extraordinary and because it also is part of why it's unfairly applied across the state because small counties can't possibly afford to do this. Um, but, but Enrique, I've spent many, many hours meeting many families who've lost loved ones in, in homicides and, 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 and in cases that are just as horrific as the ones that are on death row but didn't go for some reason or didn't end up with a death sentence. I, I feel for people. I mean, it's, it's awful. And, I, and their perspective is absolutely correct when it comes to their family and how they feel and how, what they lost. But I, th I think if we're ever going to change the law in the state. We're going to have to look at this holistically as a, as a program, as a sentencing option. And you are going to have to look at it with the hard and fast cost-benefit analysis that you give any other program in the state. Yeah. So I, I understand that people, that, that people, that there's an internal kind of an yeah, innate... It's, there's an emotional It's an ancient, here. feudal, you know, kind of feeling within every human being. You did something to my family, you have to die. Yeah, the truth is... 
we're not any good at it here. We're not Texas, and we don't want to be Texas. But in you know, 38 years, $50 million later, two men executed uh, when we have a perfectly good option. Uh, so it is, I think, necessary to look at it in any sort of criminal justice reform. You kind of have to back up a little bit and look at the big picture and say, is this worth it? Is it making us safer? Uh, is it working? And I can't conclude that it works in Washington yeah, State. I'm curious, you mentioned, why is California, why is that such a problem for that whole issue? For them? Well, they've, they've uh, used the death penalty quite, uh, quite liberally down there. They've, they've had tremendous crime problems, juries willing to, to do it, to, to, to grant a death verdict. Uh, and they haven't been executing anybody. And so men show up regularly on death row 750, and they haven't had an execution in 13 years, so imagine how, how they would ever even keep up with, with that. I, I think that system's going to collapse under its own weight. That's not our problem. I mean, a lot of problems you see around the country with the death penalty are not Washington's story. I think prosecutors have done, done a good job of, of administering it as fairly as we can and, and conservatively and, and not, not often, and we don't use it as leverage for a plea bargain. Um, but we are still stuck in this position in 2018 where, where we have the opportunity for the legislator to, take, legislature to take a look at it. And not all the prosecutors agreed with me, and a couple of them showed up to testify yeah. that they wanted to keep it. Um, but having struggled with this for 27 years, I cannot say that it works. Did you hear from other prosecutors? Pardon me, other prosecutors about this? Oh, yeah, they're not shy. They're not <laughs> shy. And, and, and the truth is that, there, that many of the prosecutors would, would say that they support it, but, but serve small counties that don't have a lot of money and would never even consider actually seeking the death penalty. So you can, I mean, people tell me they support the death penalty. I ask them this. I say, well, do you, do you support the death penalty that you wish that we had or the one that we actually have? And if you, because the one that we actually have is way too slow. I mean, 20 years to get to a final sentence. It's way too expensive, $5 million just for the trial. And it doesn't serve victims. It takes victims on a roller coaster ride that, that they really never get over. So uh, to me, I, I think the le legislature ought to take a real hard look at this state program and say, we can do better. Uh, and, and the system, I think, overall will be stronger without it. So where does this stand now? You, you testify before uh, the Senate committee on the bill, uh, 6052. Uh, they, uh, are they going to vote on it soon? And Yesterday it passed out a committee and so it's heading for a, a vote on the Senate floor. It doesn't have a fiscal impact uh, and so then it will go, if it passes in the Senate, now it's the House's turn. Now for the last number of years, uh, because the Senate had been uh, controlled by Republicans, the, the Senate wouldn't give it a hearing. And the House did, and so now it started in the Senate because it's now the Democratic majority in the Senate, and now it'll head to the House. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I don't. It's not an easy lift, right. and there are there are very strong competing principles. There are tremendous emotions involved. I respect people who are on the other side of this thing. It's taken me a long time to get there. I'm just looking at it as a, as somebody as a prosecutor who's been asked to make it work. And I've come to the conclusion that we can't make it work here, and you can't fix it. Nothing the state legislature will do can change federal courts, right? These are, these are the jurisprudence, the case law, the practice around capital punishment has evolved in the last 38 years, and it is what it is, and you can't fix it. Dan Satterberg, well, we shall see what happens with the death penalty and how it, uh, whether it will be abolished here in the state of Washington. Uh, obviously, a, a strong emotional issue, um, and I would, I would take it that it uh, has hit you emotionally, too, in just dealing with it. it. It's, I hate to disappoint people. I hate to make promises to families of victims that we can't keep. And unfortunately, I think we've been making those promises, that we're going to seek this ultimate justice only to find that our system doesn't produce that. All right. We shall see what happens down in Olympia and, and how, how this plays out here in the state. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it very much. And thank you for joining us for this edition of King County Connects. Visit us online at kingcounty.gov slash KCTV. I'm Enrique Serna, and we'll see you next time.